Today I'm going to quickly just run through what intellectual property is, um, look at what things in the animation industry can be protected, um, and also uh, following on a bit from, uh, from the, the, the talk that Oves and Farhan gave, um, understanding the value of IP in terms of what investors look for and how you can um, uh, protect yourself and also where it can go wrong, giving examples of a couple of cases uh, involving some famous names. So what is IP? Well, this is a, a definition from the World Intellectual Property Organization, and it basically refers to creations of the mind, so inventions, literary, artistic works, symbols, names, and images, and designs. There are two, two main types of IP. Um, industrial property, this is probably less relevant to the animation industry, so inventions, um, uh, unless you're on the sort of technology, uh, technology side of animation, probably um, patents uh, unlikely to trouble you too much. Um, but trademarks, very important, uh, so brands. You'll see uh, here the 99 and the little R in the circle um, indicating that that's a registered trademark, um, which it is in the US and several other countries. Um, you've also got industrial designs, indications of source, less, less relevant. Copyright, though, the second sort of limb of IP, very relevant to the animation industry. Uh, it includes literary and artistic works, which is um, pretty much you know, it's what you're doing. So it's novels, it's the stories... Uh, as they're written down, it's the films and the, the graphics, um, musical and artistic works. Um, and then there are also um, a, a whole suite of related rights, so performance rights for artists, um, broadcast rights, and things can also be sort of bundled into, into groups of rights, as we'll see a bit, um, a bit later. So the types of IP that can be protected um, for animators and things that will interest you um, as animators. Um, obviously, graphics, um, very important, protected as uh, artistic copyright. Uh, text, the, um, uh, the stories uh, um, of comics, magazines, um, can also be protected um, as literary copyright. A bit harder to, to protect and to stop people copying um, are the, 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 the themes and ideas, the storylines, things that haven't been put down um, necessarily into paper. Um, and th there's no real intellectual property um, in itself, only protects the, um, the way ideas are embodied. So the, the, um, uh, the story as it's written down on the page, or the, um, the, the comic or cartoon as it sort of appears on the screen or on the page. Um, it doesn't protect the, the underlying idea. Now, that's not to say you can't protect those, you can in different ways. And someone earlier was talking about um, you know, being a startup and, and stopping people taking his idea. Obviously, the best way to, to protect your idea is to keep it up there um, in your head and not tell anyone. Um, but you also can protect it through contracts. So you might be familiar with um, confidentiality agreements or NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. They're ways of protecting your rights and protecting your, your um, importance. So names, titles, catchphrases, we already mentioned trademarks such as the 99, uh, such as uh, Superman. Um, Superman itself uh, was trademarked. The, the, um, the sort of famous block lettering that you see um, dating back to, to 1938, that, that trademark. So there's lots of old um, existing trademarks and, and new ones coming all the time. They all have to be registered. And, and in fact, trademarks don't, don't necessarily need to be... Um, uh, they, they must be able to be represented graphically, but they don't need to be uh, just a name or logo. They can actually be um, sounds, maybe even smells. If you can write down what something smells like, um, you can perhaps try and protect that. So. In terms of sounds, for example, um, Homer Simpson's famous dolt catchphrase, that's uh, trademarked in the US um, as a sound trademark to 20th Century Fox. Um, characters then, when we think of animation, we often think of characters um, such as Superman, um, you know, the Smurfs, anybody, any of these characters. Uh, there are no specific rights to protect um, a character, but it's kind of a bundle of all those things. So it's the copyright in the, in the image, um, it's the branding, protecting the branding, registering the, the, the name as a trademark. Um, and then you've got the bundled and related rights. So merchandising. Um, merchandising is essentially giving someone else the right to use the, the IP that you've created to create um, lunch boxes or um, you know, clothing, that sort of thing. Um, you're giving them the rights to use your brand, and that's, that's the, the sort of whole bundle of brands that you've, you've put together and, and created value in. Uh, broadcasting format rights, other examples of, of bundled rights. So what can you do with your IP? Well, 
Um, first, and, and perhaps um, the, the sort of initial reason for registering something as a trademark or, or, or protecting your copyright in that would be defensive. It's to stop other people from using the same trademark. So um, uh, DC Comics obviously don't want anyone else having a Superman, so they protect that through a trademark and they aggressively protect it um, through enforcing and through the courts. Um, if you've got IP, if you, you protect it, you can obviously license it. As we said, merchandising is one example of licensing. Um, than the 1990s example of uh, where, you know, where the comic has um, uh, licensed Endemol, you heard, heard before from Farhan, how they're licensing them to, to publish and distribute um, the animated series. Um, so you can license that, you keep the ownership, but you let other people do the hard work, do what they're good at, and uh, you get a revenue stream um, in the form of royalties from that. You can assign or sell it the intellectual property that you create. So um, if you have a whole stable of characters and, and one's not particularly fitting your, your brand, you could sell that one and sell the rights in it for someone else to exploit. Um, and finally, future company value. That's what um, uh, Riada were talking about earlier in terms of um, investing into a business. Um, creating a stable of, of, of intellectual property rights um, that have some value will, will create, you know, and, and sort of holding them within a company creates value in that company that, that people can then invest in. So what do investors look for in terms of IP rights specifically? Um, clearly they want you to own any IP rights if they're going to invest in you. Uh, they're, they're not going to um, be investing in, in, in sort of basic ideas. They want to see that you've got your trademarks registered, that you've got a process to understand. And, and that's, that follows on to, to sort of the paper trail. That's very important for um, uh, understanding um, uh, that, that, that you know that IP is valuable and you've kept your IP valuable so that you've, um, if you've been out talking to different publishers, you, you've um, uh, sort of got the paper trail, you've got a confidentiality agreements in place with those publishers. Um, if you um, are a, a slightly larger business and you're engaging um, artists uh, and, and animators to work for you, um, you've got um, proper contracts in place with them so that the IP rights that they create are assigned to you. Um, if you're the owner of a company, your employees have got similar um, clauses in their contracts. Um, so, and, and that goes on to sort of other precautions, which are things like the NDAs um, and, and uh, having policies really to, to understand where IP is, is popping up in, and where it's being developed in your business um, and having a sort of culture um, of protection. Um, that's very important. And, and I think another thing that, that um, sort of on the flip side of, you know, um, an investor wants to make sure that you own things, an investor also wants to make sure that if they invest in you, um, no one's going to come along and sue the company um, because you've actually infringed other people's rights. So they want to know that anything you're using um, uh, is your own creation or is properly an authorised, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, correctly licensed from a third party. So they want to know that you're not infringing any third party rights. So let's look at some examples. Uh, I've just got a, a, a few cases um, and then we'll close up um, of uh, that show really the importance of IP and, and how IP impacts the law. And the first one, um, you, you may recognize um, the name of, of Jack Kirby. He was um, referred to in the judgment in this case. Uh, this case was about copyright and ownership in um, certain materials um, that were created in the 50s and 60s, sort of the, 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 um, uh, really one of the, the, the high times for, for comic books. Um, he created some materials and there was a dispute over whether he owned it. His, his um, heirs and his estate after he died tried to reclaim that copyright. Um, Marvel Comics said that these works were actually works um, made for hire, which is a, a US term which means that an employee, uh, essentially means an employee created those works um, in the course of his employment so that the employer, i.e. Marvel Comics, actually owns the copyright and it's nothing to do with the, the employee. And, and one of the, the um, uh, ultimately that, that was uh, ruled in Marvel's favour only, only um, uh, fairly recently this year. Um, there wasn't any written contract but the, the judge decided that ultimately Kirby didn't create the artwork until Stanley told him to. So he wasn't, it wasn't coming from um, his own creations. But one of the things I just wanted to quote from that um, judgment from the, the um, I think it was the New York District Court, um, it, it kind of really, this, this quote really for me sums up um, 
IP um, because it can be seen as a bit of an emotional issue, um, and especially in a case like this where you know people know the name Jack Kirby, they know the main name Marvel Comics. Um, the judge said, contrary to recent press accounts and editorials, um, this case is not about where Jack, whether Jack Kirby or Stan Lee is the real creator of Marvel characters, or whether Kirby and other freelance artists who created culturally iconic comic book characters for Marvel and other publishers were treated fairly by those co companies that grew rich off the fruits of their labor. Um, it's about whether Kirby's work qualifies as work for hire under the Copyright Act of 1909. If it does, then Marvel owns the copyright in the Kirby works, whether that's fair or not. Um, if it doesn't, then the Kirby heirs have a statutory right to take back those copy copyrights, no matter the impact on a recent corporate acquisition or on earnings from blockbuster movies made and yet to be made. So just to summarize, um, I, I've highlighted sort of four key things for animators to be thinking about. Number one is, is to, to identify, work out what's valuable in what you're creating, um, what you can protect, and also what other people have protected. You don't want to be tripping yourself up um, and copying their work. Um, number two is protect. So um, once you've identified what you've got, register it or protect it in, a, in your employment contracts, your um, contracts with, with people that you commission. Protect it through the general culture of your business. Um, exploit it, number three. Obviously, you know, if you want to make money, um, no, no use just holding IP and sitting on it and doing nothing with it, but look to license it, look to get investment into your business. Um, and finally, enforce. Um, take action against people that are, are taking, um, uh, taking action against you. Don't let them, uh, if you start letting people run with your brands and sort of do things to, to your brands, um, it starts off small, but you know that, that, then it, that's when it escalates into to larger things. Um, so take quick and decisive and, and consistent action.